there seems to be a phenomenon in golf and it affects all skill levels from novice all the way up to world-class players and nobody is immune and that is that you can play one of your best rounds and then for almost no apparent reason a short time after uh for amateurs and the professional level seems to be a gradual uh process but your, your next round or all of a sudden you can't explain how it's very difficult for the club face to find the ball and go in the direction that you intend it to go. In fact, it goes in a complete opposite direction sometimes. Uh, and, and this phenomenon, so to speak, seems to happen uh, without much of a explanation. I mean, you can talk to sports psychologists, you can talk to swing gurus, uh, and you'll get a multitude of various reasons. But for each individual golfer, sometimes it's hard to pinpoint. Well, my guest today experienced the latter to where he was playing professional golf and went from playing what he had considered to be okay to all of a sudden uh, the simplest of things as far as the mental approach changed, and he went on to win about 15 events in that year. Uh, his name is Mark Silvers. He's a uh, former professional golfer. He's played at some of the highest level, at the highest level, uh, Corn Ferry Tour. He's played on the PGA Tour. He's won on the McKenzie Tour, which for some of you who don't know is, is the Canadian Tour. Um, Latin America and all over various different tours around the country. Uh, and he really uh, sheds some light into the thinking process of a professional golfer from week to week, from season to season, and from year to year. Uh, we talk about, again, going back to the, what might cause something uh, to get triggered to make you either go into a slump or start playing better than you ever thought before. Uh, we talk about the dreaded Q school and why second stage for so long uh, was getting through that was so important. How f frightening and harrowing Q school can be for so many, uh, as it turns out to be maybe one of the most difficult tournaments a professional golfer ever plays in. And then just about anything else you can imagine uh, that relates to, to professional golf. So uh, Mark is a, is a great guy. Uh, he's born and bred in Savannah. He's one of a long line of great golfers from Savannah and the Low Country, and a very endearing person. You're, that's going to come across right away, and you're going to get a very – good um, understanding of why he is liked and adored by so many. So uh, just a great episode. I really enjoyed talking to him. I think you're really going to enjoy listening to what he has to say. Again, he really pulls back the curtain on the mental side and what goes through the mind of somebody playing at uh, the most elite levels of this game. So grab your favorite chair, grab your favorite beverage, adult or otherwise, sit back, relax. But first, please give a big Warm Golf 360 welcome to my guest today, professional golfer, Mr. Mark Silvers. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Golf 360 podcast. I'm the host, Pete Popovich. So you may be asking yourself, what is Golf 360? And Golf 360 is a show that was designed to introduce you to people associated with the game of golf to help you improve not only at your game, but also your life. Almost all of our guests are from within the industry in some way, shape, or form, but some of the guests we have are from outside the industry, and it mainly revolves around the business world with a few others scattered in here and there. Now, all of the guests that we have have a few things in common. One, they all were highly successful and accomplished in their field. Two, each has something to pass along that will help you in your game and your life. And three, they were all more than willing to give back by passing along the things that they use to help them in their career and even some of the mistakes that they made so that others don't make them in their journey. So I hope you find listening to them as enjoyable as I did interviewing them and that each and every one of you benefits from the information that they so willingly and graciously pass along. Hey everybody, I want to give a big shout out to a new sponsor of the Golf 360 podcast and that's Affinity Wealth Management Group. We all work exceptionally hard for our money and none of us can afford to let that uh, fall into the dark abyss of the big box financial service firms and their jack of all trades and master of none mantra, which basically means you become a number within a cookie cutter model that's also often accompanied by massive fees. Your future deserves more than average returns and little attention. At Affinity Wealth Management, they ensure that your financial goals receive highly individualized, tailored attention from experts, not just advisors, who are in the industry to be great and not average. As a client of Affinity Wealth, you receive a customized solution to your customized life, keeping in mind your family's financial situation, values, and risk tolerance. 
Call Affinity Wealth today for a no-cost consultation with one of their experts at 724-754-8200. Again, that's 724-754-8200. Or you can also check them out on the web at www.affinitywealthmg.com. That's A-F-F-I-N-I-T-Y W-E-A-L-T-H-M-G dot com. This podcast is brought to you in part by Just Thrive Probiotic. You may be surprised to learn that your digestive system is the key to creating and maintaining the quality of your physical, mental, and emotional health, and it's one of the body's most essential systems. That's why the majority of nutritionists today highly recommend probiotics as an indispensable nutritional supplement. As a discriminating consumer, you've probably been searching for a probiotic that is proven, potent, and effective, and you found it. Just Thrive is your best choice for maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Just Thrive Probiotic captures the power of hundreds of thousands of years of nature's design with a specialized bacillus strain formulation that guarantees survivability through the stomach and upper digestive system. Supports optimum gut health, digestive health, immune health, and delivers antioxidants. Great for adults, kids, and the whole family. Use promo code GOLF360 at www.thriveprobiotic.com for 10% off your order. All right, we're here with the uh, playboy of Savannah, also a (laughs) professional golfer, (laughs) and and now um, pickleball sensation, uh, Mr. Mark Silvers. Mark, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And uh, roughly half of that is true, and I'm going to let the people uh, figure out which half is true and which half is not. <laughs> you know, um, rumor has it you are big into pickleball now. Is that is that, that true? Is, that is correct. Yeah, um, I, along with uh, God, it's it's countless other people uh, seem to have gotten gotten hooked on this wacky little sport that seems to be taking over the world. And you play mostly over at Savannah Golf Club? I do, yeah. Um, what did they of, tear uh, down to put in the pickleball court? So there was one, we had one hard court, um, and unbeknownst to me, I was traveling. Uh, uh, this was 2018, 2019. Unbeknownst to me, they, they put some line, taped some lines down, and it got popular enough at the club uh, to where they converted uh, our one – hard court into four pickleball courts um i had no idea what it was uh until a buddy of mine introduced it to me um but yeah and now since then they've converted another one of our clay courts into four more pickleball courts and down the road already have plans for four more we're we're building an absolute dynasty (laughs) so uh, as we were talking before we came on a number of our buddies over there they they sent me some questions to ask you and one of them was are are you going to go pro or are you just going to remain the unpaid assistant pickleball pro at savannah golf club um you know what i think (laughs) i think the honor is being the unpaid assistant um i'm going to go with that considering i've been lucky enough to be around some of the best pickleball players in the world and i would not score a point on any of them no matter how good i get so uh i'm gonna say it's uh you know kind of the bobby jones thing gonna do the honorable thing and be an amateur and i'm just gonna stick with that rationale that that sounds fair enough you you know Mm -hmm. it's funny that you brought that up about guys who are really really good and and you were one of those people in golf and we're gonna get into that tonight um but I, i was uh, goofing around on YouTube last night and um, came across this video of uh, oh, what was his name? He was the uh, he played for the Celtics, Scalabrini. Um, okay. Brian Scalabrini, big dude, about six nine or ten, I think, redhead. Um, and there was a th- uh, thing that they, I guess, they started a show or something like that. He, he and some guys that um, uh, they call it the Scalenge for Scalabrini in the challenge. And, and they yeah. basically took, uh, they had one guy that was division one ball player who played at Syracuse. Then there was another guy that played, I think in Australia pro basketball. And I, okay. and then there was a, like a YouTube sensation that, that was like a semi pro somewhere. And he played one-on-one against each of them. And, and yep. the whole point was to illustrate how good an NBA player is, even if they're like a ride the bench or they're, you know, eighth on the roster. And uh, of all those players, I think the average that he beat them was eleven to two. Yeah, 
in, they, they couldn't stop him. And, and they're like, you know, Scalabrini in his entire career scored less points than James Harden did in the first 60 games of this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it, uh, you know, we, pickleball is such a social sport and, you know, we have a group of guys that have gotten pretty good at our club and, you know, it, it's not, doesn't have like the national notoriety unless you're kind of cued into it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so your average guy looks at a guy like me who's, you know, I'm like a four or five pickleball player and they're like, holy, you know, how, how can it be much better than you? And I'm like, well, you, you don't, you know, it's like anything. You, you just have no idea how good the guys who do it for a living are and and you know it's such a young sport especially to do professionally they're just getting better and better and better and uh luckily um i've i've been able to be on a court with some of those guys and uh, i mean it's just they, they make me look silly just like if i was to try to play pick up basketball with with the 200th best player in the nba i wouldn't score a point it's mm-hmm. kind of the same thing like you, you know we armchair quarterback and and we watch and everybody you watch is good and and you don't ever have like a point of reference to realize how good they all are you know i i when i when i was off of playing full time <clears throat> i was watching a, mm-hmm. one of the tour events and might have been an open I, I can't remember exactly what it was but you know they, they got, they've got the uh audio and the mic down there and they're going through the player caddy discussion and you know the guy whoever it was was in wedge distance and you know, the, the caddy gives them the yardage. It's like, you know, 89 to the bunker edge and 93 to the to the edge of the green and then 97 to the pin. And my dad looks at me and says, are, are guys really that good? Where He goes, were you that good? I said, well, on the days that you're on, yeah, you, you can dial yes. it in within a yard. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. the, no doubt. But the days that you're off, knowing your yardages will at least allow you to avoid – hitting it in the bunker. So you might hit it 15 to 20 feet past instead of three feet, but you know, coming in impact, if you need to add just a little bit more or take just a little bit off. So that that's where that difference is. And right. I had to, right. My dad just, you know, he's a 20 handicap and he, it, it was hard for him to even comprehend that, but he goes, yeah, I, I get it. I just don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. I had that conversation with somebody uh, when they were talking about the, um, um, using the range fighters for the PGA. And mm-hmm. somebody was like, you know, are a bunch of guys going to be using it? And I was like, absolutely not. Um, you know, they're, they're good for like shooting a bunker or something or different tees and practice rounds. But if you ever look at a tour yardage book, nobody ever just shoots a pin and that's how far they hit it. Mm-mm. You know, you, you're never very, very rarely are you just shooting one number and that's what you're going for. Um, you know, you've got cover numbers and slopes and, you know, your max carries and your front edges and things like that, like that, you know, those guys are so good that, you know, very rarely are you ever looking at, okay, I've got 164 yards. Give me my, I'm going to hit this 164 yard shot. That's just, that's not how golf at that level works. Yeah. It's more about, at least for me, it was about placement and and where you want to either come into the pin from and I'm not not talking angles on because I, I know that like guys like Decade and Scott Fawcett are really kind of right. proving that wrong. Uh, I'm I'm just talking about where as you said slopes and at that mm-hmm. level it seems like every pin is tucked um, and and carries and okay am, am I on today if, if I'm not on today where's my miss and then how do I work it into that pin or or give me the best chance of, of having a decent look at birdie. Uh, right. to, 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 as you said, you're okay. Here's the pin. Where's the slope number? What's the front yeah. edge number? Um, yeah. yeah. right. So it, it, it's, it's like a science that, that at that level it's happening instantaneously. It's in, it's in, instinctual. Right. Yeah. If, if the pin's here, I'm going to hit it here. You mm-hmm. know, if it's 30 on, I'm only going to hit it 26 on and, you know, aim 15 feet right of it and, you know, give myself a 30 footer or 20 footer. Um, you know, and that's just, it's all in the prep work that people don't see. You know, a, a, a big thing that that's a lot of questions that I'm getting from amateurs now as we either play or hang out or, you know, whatever you're, you're talking to somebody and is the one thing that they're asking is, and, and I always ask this, or I've started asking this of, of guys who played at a very high level and other coaches. And w- when somebody's that good, um, take like a, a Jordan Spieth or a Rory. How do they mm-hmm. how do they have such a tumble from 
being the number one player in the world to struggling to make cuts? I mean, I guess the best way to describe it is I would have amateurs that are like, oh, well, you know, I'm struggling with this or I don't know where it's going or, or, you know, so I'm feeling shaky over this shot. You guys just, you don't even know what that feels like. And I'm like, no, we do. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, and if I do, I know that the best players in the world do as well, because you see that happen. And nobody other than maybe Tiger, although we, he showed, you know, some stuff with his chipping and, and driving that, you know, would showed some chinks in the armor. But um, nobody is immune from golf. And, you know, when, when you play golf with that level of confidence and you're so used to your mind working and your body performing and all of a sudden what you see in your head doesn't match up with what your body's doing, it's it's a it'll mess you up. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when you get guys at that high level where all of a sudden their brain is working one way and the shots that are coming out are not doing that, you know, it can, it can really mess you up. It was like, you know, with speed for a couple of years, I mean, the guy never missed a putt inside of 20 feet. Yeah. No. And eventually that's what your brain tells you to do. Okay. I'm in this situation. This is, it's going to go in. Or doesn't matter how poorly I'm hitting it, my putting is going to save me. Well, all of a sudden you get in a little rut where your putting stops saving you. Then the pressure deflects to the ball striking, and then it's just it becomes this vicious cycle, um, you know. And and your entire game before you realize it is in the trash. Kind of the same thing I think Rory openly admitted that he you know he saw what Bryson Shambo was doing and he was going to chase, you know trying to hit it an extra 10 or 15 yards. And before you know it, he's hitting these like giant banana pull hooks. And uh, he goes from one of the best drivers of the golf ball in the world to all of a sudden I can't drive it on the planet. And now what do I do? Mm -hmm. Um, and, And it's just, it's, it's crazy that, you know, even down to the little things where you get on the first tee and you're like, wow, my hands just don't feel right on the club. Some days, nobody, nobody really is immune to it. And, um, when, when you're at, when you're going at that high a speed, the slightest bump can, can throw you off something fierce. I mean, I've seen some of the best players in the world just get the putting yips or the chipping yips or the, all of a sudden they can't drive it on the golf course. And, you know, you're like, where, where does that even come from? Yeah. The, the two things I explained to a lot of people who asked me what it was like playing golf at a high level, um, as you just said, it, it, it the speeds that you're going and I think I've said this on the show before is it's like, you know, if you're rolling through your neighborhood on idle and you run over a one inch stick that fell during a storm, you, your tire is just going to break it and you, you hardly even right. feel it. But you're in an Indy car going 185 miles an hour and you hit the same stick, you're dead. Yep. Right. It, it, it yep. throws you off that much. And, and the margins yep. for error at, at once you get to professional golf, whether it's a mini tour, corn Ferry, McKenzie, latin america pga are so small and they get smaller right. and smaller the higher you go that that and and that really i think gets into somebody's head or, or can if there's a it's like a um if there's a little crack and, and some water can get in there and then it starts doing damage that, that then then you got some trouble yeah i um I, the first time i really realized that i kind of had had this giant awakening i i qualified for the u.s open at pebble up right out of college and got paired with a guy uh, in a practice round the, you know, knowledge of one of my old coaches that was trying to help him out. um, A former number one player in the world who had kind of fallen off. And um, we ended up just playing a practice round together and it was super cool. And and we got up on 18 and you could tell he was trying to paint it down the coastline and and just bleed it back into the fairway like he did back in the heyday. Mm -hmm. And he just kept hitting dump hook after dump hook out in the out in the in the ocean and i'm like god that's got and it just kind of dawned on me like it's got to be tough you know when you're that good number one player in the world you know making all this money driving it down the middle every fairway and then for whatever reason you have this break where your game you kind of lose your game and then you try to come back and your brain sees the shots that you think you should be hitting and you know, you can hit, but you can't hit those shots anymore. 
Yeah, and I, I like, feel that I with can, my body now. <laughs> well, and now that I'm not, and, and, and now that I'm not like practicing every day or or ever really, um, and playing, you know, sporadically, I'm I'm finding the same thing. Like, okay, you know, I'm just going to hit a little feather cut, you know, whatever six iron into this pin, and I hit a yank hook, and I'm like. I'm not that good right now. Like, what are you trying to do? Just hit it in the middle of the green. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to it's hard to turn that off. I can remember distinctly. So, if, if when I was playing, if I took a week off, it would, and then went to go start. You know, if you got two weeks off and you take one week to just decompress, mm-hmm. and then you you, know, you start playing lo- with the guys and and just to get your timing and everything back. It, it would take a couple holes before. Mm-hmm. You, you would dial it in and then so when i got done playing if i didn't play for a couple of weeks it it got to a point where it would take nine holes to, to get it back dialed in and then yep. it, it kept getting longer and longer until one day i came home and I told my girlfriend i said i've lost the cape yep. <laughs> you know, superman's lost his cape right i you yep. know because i was i was seeing shots and i could step up to hit it and it would go complete opposite right or nowhere near what i expected yep and I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm back in the real world now. That's right. Now, now I remember why everybody says this game is so hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, you had a, a very successful career. Um, e- even though you, you lo- looking back, once you reach a certain level, you look back and you're just you want to continue to go forward. But if you, as as we look back now, and I think you've been playing, not playing for a few years, as you look back, you can obviously say, yeah, the level you got to is very high, higher than probably ninety nine point not five percent of the people that play golf in the world. You you yeah. you, you played at a higher level than that. Um, so th- let's just jump back to the beginning a little bit and how you got started and who got you into it and helped you along and things like that. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I had a club. Um, in my hand as, as a toddler, my dad was a big golfer, played for a couple of years at LSU before he, uh, transferred back to go to school closer to home and, um, just was a golf nut, loved everything about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I played every sport growing up, basketball, soccer, baseball, the whole shebang. And and it kind of got to the point where I was getting better at golf and enjoying it. And, you know, it was something that I did um, with my dad and, and, um, it got to the point where baseball and golf were in the same season in high school, kind of had to make a decision and decided to go with golf and, uh, poured pretty much everything into it. And, um, you know, I, I had some, had some kind of crappy fundamentals. I had a really strong grip at a big dumpy hook, but kind of just figured out how to get it around and, had moderate enough success and, and good enough grades to where I got a last second opportunity where, where a small amount of scholarship popped up um, at South Carolina and, and coach at Tom Puggy um, gave me a shot um, just kind of as a last minute addition. Um, and I would say that the biggest thing in my golf career that happened was um, Puggy ended up kind of semi-retiring and brought in a guy named Bill McDonald uh, at South Carolina. And Bill was a, a really good player. He actually played for Puggy at Georgia Tech and played professionally for a couple of years and was a, ended up staying in the golf business as, as a teacher and kind of looked at me and was like, why is this kid on this team? Uh, <laughs> you, you watch it, I remember, I, I'll never forget at, at Spring Valley in Columbia, him watching me play about nine holes in a qualifier at the beginning of my sophomore year and was like, um, can I watch you hit a couple of balls? And he was like, you, you cannot play Division One golf hitting that big of a hook. Um, do you have like a swing coach? And I was like, eh, not really. I just kind of been trying to figure it out on my own. He was like, let me let me help you. And, uh, yeah, just kind of got a little bit better each year. Mm-hmm. And to, to not, I'll get in, I want to get into that, but one thing I want to ask you about, cause you're obviously friends with Tim O'Neill and Timmy was on last yep. week and mm-hmm. I, I kind of tagged you all you guys that the bacon park boys, um, yep. cause you, it, he grew up, did, did you play most of your golf and, and 
learned playing over at Bacon Park with with that crew of him and Tommy Schaff and some I, other I guys. I did, yeah. And obviously, Tim, Tim and Tommy were older, and we all looked at them like they were, you know, these these mega stars. And you know, that was about the time where Tim was kind of, you know, popping up on in the golf world for you know one reason or another. Unfortunately, a couple of years because of, of of some crazy stuff that happened to him at Q School, but. Um, yeah, I mean, Timmy, I just remember being so freaking good, um, which he still is. He looks the exact same as he did. <laughs> he hasn't changed, has he? It's, it's unbelievable. I actually saw him yesterday and, uh, I was playing, playing nine holes with a guy in this little match and he was like, uh, oh, that's Tim O'Neill. I was like, yeah, can you believe he's 48? And he was like, wait, what? That guy's not 48 <laughs> years old. I was like, I know he's in better shape than, than I am. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, man, there was, there was a whole gaggle of us, uh, teenagers that, you know, we're all trying to play high school golf and, you know, our parents would drop us off at the Muni and, and we would just hang out there all day. I, I worked out there picking, picking the range and stuff like that for the free golf. And, uh, we'd valet cars for the city amateur that was out there every year and, um, just, you know, chip for used golf balls and stuff. And I, I was out there all day, every day. And I just absolutely loved it. it his, his, uh, th- they got some reinvigorated, didn't it? With, with OC Welch getting involved and, in, and, in, in that yeah. whole operation. Yeah. I mean, it, it was really cool. Cause, um, you know, it was Donald Ross actually originally designed four golf courses for, for bacon park back in like the twenties or thirties. Mm-hmm. And two of them were built, uh, one of them ended up being a, you know, a neighborhood over there across the street and the other one, uh, remained. And in the seventies, when the city took it over, uh, they kind of merged it and built, uh, it kind of went around this low area, uh, kind of a floodplain and they built nine holes in the floodplain and then wove all the holes together. So it was three nines and, and you'd get kind of couple of holes of the original course and a couple of holes of the regular one that were wet and ran this canal ran through them and um when oc took it over he uh he restored restored it back to the original 18 and then basically made almost like a little executive course uh in the middle so so it's pretty cool that that it's back to uh more the original layout that that Donald Ross intended. There's probably not a whole lot of people that can say their city has a municipal city golf course that's an original Donald Ross. No, and what was is amazing is he's uh, what are there four courses in Savannah that are Ross courses? You got the golf club, Bacon Park, um, the old Savannah the, yeah. in uh, the Sheridan yeah. course. I, I can never remember the new name of it. Was it? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it was the Wilmington Island club. Now it's Savannah country club. Yes. And um, then the, the military course is a Ross course, isn't it? I think it, I think the original nine might've been, I, I know, I, I know it was only nine when it was designed. Um, but then, you know, right down the road, you've got Brunswick country club as well. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we've actually been doing some digging at the Savannah Golf Club where I'm a member because Gil Hans is doing um, a renovation of it. And, mm-hmm. and so we've been trying to kind of dig to see how involved uh, Donald Ross was, um, you know, in the in the building and, and designing of, of our club. Geez, for anybody that's played the, the – well, it used to be the first hole. Now it's the tenth hole, isn't it? The, that, with that raised green and that, not like, 90-degree mm-hmm. dog leg. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, he was, I'd say he was probably hands on on that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was the most terrifying first hole in, in all of golf. Oh. That was number one. And that green with that hourglass shape. I mean, yep. yeah. Oof, yeah. He could make a number there quick. You know, um, is pl- playing against guys like, like Tim and, and the guys who are older than you. Um, and, and is it's kind of, kind of be known that, that as all of us are young and our belief system is pretty firmly established when we're kids without even knowing it, you know, like a subconscious. Um, and it kind of becomes the groundwork for, for us as young adults and adults, um, building character, overcoming challenges, things like that. Was it good? Do you think looking back growing up against guys who were much older and well advanced, um, that you really had to, to, to improve, figure out ways to, to get better, to, to try to even compete with them? 
Yeah, for sure. And I mean, there was there was uh, some guys even a little more immediate, um, you know, five six years older uh, than I was that um, went on to play some college golf. And you know, as a thirteen year old or twelve year old looking at a you know seventeen eighteen year old uh, kid that's getting ready to go play Division one college golf, you're like, holy crap! You know, look at what they can do with the golf ball. And they can shoot in the sixties, and you mm-hmm. know, it's just you're enamored by that kind of thing. And, you know, it, it definitely gives you, gives you the motivation and the drive to, to kind of get, get to where they already were. Yeah. And do you think that going through that as, as a teenager or even a young teen helped you as you went from level to level, because each time you go up in the system, uh, the golfing hierarchy, so to speak, mm-hmm. you know, uh, good junior to, to division one, to professional, to corn Ferry to PGA tour. It, 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 you think ha- having that early, um, experience, uh, served a, a very good purpose and that it, it gave you a foundation to, on where it didn't make you scared, so to speak, and that, that you, yeah. you knew you had done that in the past. For sure. And, you know, golf is all about this you have to be self-motivated and kind of intrinsically motivated to, to play golf because it's not a team sport. And, um, you know, when you kind of ingrain that early on that, okay, I'm not as good as these guys, but I want to be able to play with these guys like that. That is something that until you get to the PGA tour, that's the attitude you have to have, whether mm-hmm. it's, trying to make, you know, watching high school kids and saying, all right, when I get to high school, I want to be on the high school team. Or when you get to the high school team, I want to play college golf. Okay. I'm out of college golf. I I want to turn pro. And then you want to turn pro. I I need to get on the web doctor corn fairy tour, you know, and so on and so forth. So setting, you know, and the kids would find out early on whether you were one of those guys that just kind of enjoyed doing it and, you know, wanted to do everything else, or you looked at those guys and you're like, I want to be one of them. Um, and, and that definitely dawned on me early that, that I was always looking up at who my next level of competition was. And that's, that's, that's where I wanted to be. Did, did you, um, outside of, of that area did, and, and let's say the Savannah junior golf, did, did you play, uh, AJGA or, or, or um, like the uh, what's the one over here the the junior heritage and and some some of the bigger events or did you just kind of hang out yeah Savannah? i mean i was i was i would say i was a little bit of a late bloomer in junior golf and then again in college so by the time i kind of developed my game um i was a little bit later on like i i'm I never played a ton of AJGAs. I played a couple of like local ones. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't very consistent just because I didn't have great fundamentals, but when I hit it well, I could, I could go out, and, you know, win a regional tournament. Um, and then, you know, the guys are committing so early these days where, you know, if you're a sophomore and you're not out there playing in AJGAs and, and winning, you know, you're probably going to miss the boat in a lot of, you know, the bigger schools. Um, so going the summer between my junior and senior year was where I finally kind of, uh, I qualified for, uh, uh, us junior and, um, played well in a couple of bigger regional events. And, you know, by that time, most of your big colleges had already kind of filled up. So I had some offers that, at some great schools, but some smaller programs and, uh, was looking around and, and, you know, trying to kind of figure it out. And like I said, I was, I was super lucky that there was kind of one roster spot and just a little bit of money left at, at South Carolina. And as soon as they threw that on the table, I was, I was all in. <laughs> well, that, that was one of the questions I had for you was how the hell did a Georgia kid, uh, escape the UGA, um, powerhouse and end up at South Carolina, but that, that kind of uh, answers I mean, it. Truth- Truthfully, I wasn't good enough. I mean, you had you had Brian Harmon that, that was my age that, that had committed and uh, Adam Mitchell and all these guys that were these big AJGA names and, and top 20, you know, Rolex players. And, and then there was me. Um, you know, I, like I said, I'd, 
I, I kind of got into some of that ranking stuff, but by the time I, I kind of got there, all of those, all of those guys had already committed. And, um, luckily for me, I, I knew a handful of the guys just from some of the regional tournaments that were going to South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And, um, a guy from Savannah knew the coach, um, and wanted his son to go visit, um, and asked me to tag along. And, and I got up there and I knew all the, the guys that were coming in and, coach was like you know we don't have a whole lot of money but the guys who are coming in say they know you and they like you and you know you've got good grades so you know we can get you an academic scholarship we can't give you a ton of golf but you know i think they kind of looked at me as a low risk uh a low risk ad that they didn't have to to spend a whole lot of money on and um you know luckily the puggy was was feeling generous and, and decided to offer me that spot. And and you said the, the, the assistant coach that, that, or was putt putt guy that was Puggy's replacement kind of, uh, was your first swing instructor. For, uh, well, for... Puggy, so Puggy was the head coach right. and, um, through my freshman year, I played a couple of events my freshman year, but without much success was really struggling to, kind of find my game, putting a lot of pressure on myself. And then we came in uh, my sophomore year, and Puggy, who had been in college coaching forever, um, was like, hey, guys, like I've decided I, I, I kind of want to explore some other options in golf, and uh, I'm still going to be involved with the program, but this is Bill McDonald. He's going to be your new coach. Um. And, uh, he was a, he was a a fairly big teacher up in Atlanta and he had played for Puggy at Georgia tech. And, um, like I said, he kind of was going back and forth trying to find a house and came out and watched us play. in one of these qualifiers basically looked at me and was like, the hell this kid doing on this team? And he asked me, he was like, can can I help you? And I was like, please, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and it just, it could not have worked out better. Uh, there's absolutely no way, uh, that I would be playing that I would have played professional golf one had Puggy not given me a chance to be on the team and two had, had Billy Mack not come in and, and kind of taken hold of me and made me listen to him. What was some of the things that, that he worked with you on in the early stages? You know, a lot of fundamentals. I, I kind of had a, I, I, my pivot wasn't real good. Um, I had a tendency to kind of turn it on top of the ball. Uh, I had a super strong left hand grip. And um, he was like, I don't mind you drawing it, but we got to, we got to make it more of kind of a natural draw as opposed to just everything being shut. And, you know, <laughs> the, the, I used to call uh, it the and, Pete Weber. You know, uh, like the bowler and, started over the right gutter and sling it back to the left one. Absolutely. I had that shot in the bag, um, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I, I've got good hand eye coordination, so I could kind of make it work, but when it was off, it was, it was just horrific and, um, kind of gradually got my left hand grip a little weaker and, and got the club on plane and, and worked on my pivot. And before you know it, I was actually seeing the ball cut. Um, and to me, that was just like, this is crazy. I've never really been able, I could hit a block, but mm-hmm. I could never really hit a cut. And, uh, I just kind of embraced it and, and have hit a cut my entire life since then. Um, just for me, it, the club face was more stable and, um, you know, my, my shot shape was a little more under control and, um, you know, I just kind of took it and I was always a pretty good putter. Um, always had a pretty good short game. I had to, cause you know, there, any given day I'd hit it off the planet. And, uh, <laughs> once I started to kind of, kind of rein that in, like I had at the end of my sophomore year, um, I really didn't play that much cause I was working on my swing so much. I didn't even play in, in the SEC championship and, and the guys didn't play well. And, uh, he opened, uh, opened up a spot in the, in the lineup for regionals. And, um, I qualified and we went out and back when there was only three regionals and we had to fly out to Arizona and play and we shot like 40 something under par and won. And then we finished 10th in NCAAs. And I think I finished 20th individually and, and, um, just out of nowhere, it's like my third or fourth event of the year. And, um, 
you know, those were at the time, I don't think South Carolina had ever won a regional and it may have been the second or third highest finish in the NCAA championship in team history. And, you know, all of a sudden I was like, all right, you know, I, I'll probably do this. <laughs> um, a little eye opening. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I played, played a little bit more consistent my junior year. Um, and by my senior year, I, you know, I played every event and was, was an all American and kind of gave me the hopes of saying, you know what, maybe I can kind of give this a run trying to do it for a living. So the, 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 the decision to, to pursue professional golf didn't come until your senior year. Yeah. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I, I, and I'm a fairly logical guy and, and, you know, I'm looking at, I'm like, if I can't beat most of these guys I'm playing against in college, how am I supposed to beat those guys that are playing on TV? So, um, I never won in college, but I, I had a bunch of solid finishes, um, had a good NCAA tournament, um, decided to kind of play amateur golf that summer and feel it out. Cause it, you know, after, after I was an all American and all sec, I got, got some invites into some, some of the bigger amateur tournaments and I almost won the Southern AM and um, we had a tournament kind of a local one that had kind of grown nationally here called the Oglethorpe um, that I ended up winning and, you know, kind of just gave me that, you know, that little extra thing to, to push me over the edge to say, you know what, I, uh, I think I'm going to give this thing a go. So um, it, it was just a steady progression to, that kept building on your confidence. Correct. Yeah. Just it was like that in junior golf. And then it was like that in, uh, in, in college golf. And then, you know, kind of get, get, a get some rude awakenings going out there. Cause you know, you, sh- you have a, 72.5 stroke average in college and you're an all American and you have a 72.5 stroke average in professional golf and you go broke real fast. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was lucky. I really didn't have a whole lot of money to start with. I, I wanted to keep living in Columbia. I had to move home. I couldn't, couldn't afford to keep living there. And, um, I, I just had to kind of make it work. Luckily, um, my Savannah golf club pitched in and, and got me enough to, to play for a few months. And I just went and played wherever was cheap. And I had friends where I could, I could stay. And it actually, you know, it turned out to be a blessing because you play in these tournaments with 30, 40 guys and, and, you know, I luck up and win one or win two and, you know, you, winning kind of breeds winning so the next year i was like okay well i've made enough where i can play a tour that's a little more uh substantial and you know it was like well shoot if i can win there then i can i can win out here and make a little more money and then before you know it okay i can afford to play like the hooters tour now which back in the day was a pretty 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 solid yeah that was a big t- that, that was one of the bigger yeah. t- mini tours it was it was the I it think was, the biggest yeah, mini tour in the country for a the long biggest time. Mini tour. Yeah. You know, and I was lucky enough to win out there and, um, and then, um, you know, got some, some web.com tour status after that one up in Canada. And unfortunately that's where, uh, that's where the, the winning was capped off. But, uh, um, but no, played, played well in, in, in a bunch of tournaments and got to play in a couple of majors and, and it was, it was, it was a fun ride. When, uh, what, what did, what were the, the, uh, events that you started playing when you were moved back home to Savannah? So I played a lot on the, Oh God, what was it called? Uh, it was in Myrtle beach. Uh, my buddy, Zach bird, who's now, um, actually he's the assistant coach at Ole Miss, uh, for the ladies who just won the national championship. Um, Oh, it's going to kill me what that little tour was called, but, uh, Zach, that was in the winter, wasn't it? Uh, well, there, there, there was a Hooters tour winter series in Myrtle beach. Um, and there was another just local Myrtle beach tour. Um, and so Zach had, um, you know, when his buddy was, when his roommate was out of town, I crashed in their bedroom and, and then he had a pull out couch. So, I would go and spend 
couple of weeks at a time and they were all you know two-day tournaments maybe the occasional three-day tournament and um and i would just go i would sign up they were all a couple hundred bucks a piece and uh, i'd go play as many tournaments as i could in two three week span um you know and hopefully leave with with some money in my pocket um but yeah i spent a lot of time uh up in myrtle beach and then uh made enough there uh to play a tour that was started up around georgia called the peach state pro tour Mm -hmm. um kind of an atlanta based tour and um they they were kind of advertising uh some seven and ten grand winner's checks um they did a little winter series down in florida and uh, won a couple of event a couple of those events and then um I think I won eight times on that tour that year. Um, they had a tour championship that was like 20 grand. And, um, yeah, so, so had some success there and didn't get through Q school. And I was like, well, shoot, now I got enough money where I can go, uh, go out and play, play, which at the time, you know, the PGA tour didn't own China or Latin America or Canada. So if you weren't on the, uh, the nationwide tour, you know, the, the next best thing was the Hooters tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it even still had its own little Q school to, to get out there. Um, and, so and that, yeah, that was about Oh nine that you were, uh, got out of school. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I got out. In 09. Cause I think I remember that that's about the time I started hanging out in Savannah with, as I met a lot of those guys, uh, playing in the member guests and all that. And I, I vaguely remember, uh, when you were going to head out and play in, in, in a, few of the members talking about because because i was done let's see i I left playing full-time in 06 i was still doing some mondays in 07 but by 09 i was i was done um but uh remember uh hearing that that you were uh doing really well and and, and gonna go give it a shot because you're about uh dj's age right uh Uh, dustin johnson a couple of years older than yeah okay i thought so because he had just graduated a few years before um from coastal because one of right. the, uh, who is it? Uh, the one guy is a member there. His son played at Coastal with him. Uh, Japanese guy. I don't even know if he's a member there anymore. Owned like um, a few, three restaurants in, in Savannah. Yeah, well, that was Toshi. Toshi, uh, Toshi yes. Arata. Yeah, his son, his son actually played at Georgia Southern. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, he played in the, they, they played against us in the member guest one year. And that yeah. was like right when I got off playing and, and they had no, no one who knew who I was. Outside right. a couple of buddies, and they're like, "Who? Why the hell are you playing?" Here? <laughs> <laughs> said, yeah, yeah, it's a long story, but uh, took That's my shot funny. at fame and fortune. Um, going from let me back up a little bit. Go, going from uh, junior golf to college golf, and, and you 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 elaborated on on the work that you put in uh, with, with the coach and, and the changes you made. But what about did did the adaptation of now being on your own did that fuel that fire of being uncomfortable and, and uh throwing your game off um, yeah just a- adjusting to a new way of life yeah for sure uh, i mean and, and at the time you know i looked at all these guys that that had all this money behind them and um you know by no means was i destitute or anything but i was like it, it made me hungrier when you're like, Hey, if I don't play well, I, I got to figure out something else to do. Um, you know, there was, there was no other options. I was not going to go back and ask anybody, um, you know, for, for anything else. And, um, it, it made me appreciate everything, um, and definitely learn how to travel and budget, offens- uh, efficiently. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it made you, made you have to go out there and figure it out. Cause I mean, it's just like anything else. You see a bunch of guys that have a bunch of money and they kind of go out and they goof off and they don't take it super seriously and they don't put in the work and you know, it's whatever they do it for a couple of years and have fun and move on and do something else and nothing wrong with that. But that was just not really what I, uh, how I kind of viewed it and, and, those first couple of years of having to go out and I mean, and and you know, I mean, playing mini tour golf, you never knew what you were going to see when you showed up (laughs) to an event. I mean, 
luckily I'm sure uh, Tim, Tim's got all the horror stories about guys running off with, with all the purse money. I, I never had that happen to me, but I remember like, that, that happened in like 2000, probably right before you and I, I think 2008 or nine, there was a group that was, you had to put mm-hmm. up, I think 15,000. Yep. And then, yeah, those guys ran off with a lot of money. Yep. Yep. I remember hearing that. That, that was that. the big horror story. Mm, but I mean, I, I just remember the first, first sizable tournament for me that I won. I, I won about four grand or something like that was um, in Myrtle Beach. Uh, I think it was, was one of those Hooters Tour summer series or something in Myrtle Beach. Oh, Grand Strand Tour. That was it. God, I knew it would come to me. Anyway, um, I just remember like they put the leaders out the final round first for some reason. And we made the turn. Uh, we kind of we played pretty quick and all of the public play they were sending off the back that morning <laughs> was backed up. Jesus. So we had to sit there for like an hour trying to make the turn to for all of the public play to get off from their tea times that the club had had you know had put out and it was just it was stuff like that where i just remember doing that for a couple of years my first two years out of college and then you go to you know you go to play a hooters tour event you're like holy crap there's like a pro-am here and Mm -hmm. there's nobody else on the golf course except for this tour for this week like how cool is this yeah it's a, a different uh as you move up much different um i think i told tim when we're talking that that when i met him oh god when was it It was like oh six oh five playing in raleigh um and i told the story you know i was gonna i showed up for my practice around the stars like well we don't want to send you as a single you can play with the guys coming across the parking lot and here's tim coming across with this big giant jl belt buckle Mm -hmm. that i don't even know i move with that thing on um (laughs) but the then uh i didn't have status out there i just uh i think i mondayed into that one but Mm -hmm. um the next, I, I came home and I uh, to go back to work, and then two weeks later I, I went back to playing full time. But the first event I played on the Tar Heel Tour was at Charlotte National, and, and it was out in the middle of nowhere. And my girlfriend went with me to both, and we we pull into Charlotte National doing the drive in, and she's just looking around, and I'm watching her reaction. <laughs> yeah. And I said, "Welcome to the minor leagues. Mm-hmm. You know, not big time anymore." Yep. W- g- going from. Um, working on your swing and, and, and getting your game, whether you knew it or not, to, to, to a level. Uh, what did that, did, did that teach you anything that, that you use later on and a, a setback that ended up being something that, that you utilized uh, as, as you advanced through smaller tours to bigger tours? Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, you know, I was lucky that I had a lot of, of steady kind of progression. I wouldn't say I really had a ton of setbacks. I just, I kind of kept getting a little bit better each year and that it just kind of ingrained like, okay, i you know, last year I never thought I would be here. And Mm -hmm. the year before that, I never thought I would be here. And, you know, my junior year college or high school, I never thought I'd be playing golf in the sec and so on and so forth. So it was like, I kept watching people, that were getting better than me faster at every level. Um, and just watching me catch back up to them was, was really, really cool. Like, you, you know, you get to college and you're like, Oh, I remember that guy won everything at junior golf. And then at the end of the year, well, shoot, I'm ranked higher than he is. Or you get to mini tour golf and you're like, Oh my gosh, that guy played on a Walker cup team, but you know, I beat him this week. And, I will say that probably the biggest thing, I guess you could kind of call it a setback that really was kind of a game changer for me was I had, I had lost in a playoff. I'd lost in a four for three playoff to get into Raleigh um, in 2010, basically my first year out. And I was just devastated because I thought getting into one web.com tour event was like, would have changed my life entirely. Um, Um, But I was so pissed and and I went home and I was like, okay, you know, I can do stuff like this. And like three weeks later, uh, I qualified for the U S open. And I remember getting, I was, I had zero actual expectations of getting into the U S open. And I, I, I wanted a playoff to get in. I'm sitting there across from 
uh, Lane, who was who was the director um, of the GSGA, and he's going through all of this stuff for the U.S. Open, and I was like, I, I got to be perfect class. I don't even know when it is. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, "What?" I was like, "I, I never even looked to see when the freaking tournament is." I, I just, I, you know, I, I got to make got sure through, I can get fit it in. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, he's like, um. It's it's next week. It's like <laughs> holy crap! I've never played in anything other than you know a two day mini tour event, and, and now I got to fly across the country to go play in the U.S. Open. And um, I went out there and um, played practice rounds with all these guys that you know I'd watched my entire life, and then I birdied the first hole of the U.S. Open, and then shot a zillion. You know, I shot eighty one, eighty or something like that finished near the bottom but i just remember leaving there thinking okay i i played practice rounds with some of the best players in the world and they hit a lot of really crappy shots Mm -hmm. and it's not what i thought it was where you just have this image in your head where all these guys that play on the tour they don't ever miss three footers and they don't ever miss fairways and everything is solid and you know, all these, all this kind of grand illusion in, in, in my head that these guys were like these unflappable machines. And I was like, they're not, you know, I, uh, they're, they're just, they're not that. And, and I kind of left that week after shooting a zillion, actually believing in myself more. Um, and I want to say I won two out of my next three events in Myrtle Beach after I got back from the U.S. Open because I was just like, it's like okay, I you know I I, I think I can do this. Yeah, it's kind of like seeing uh, in the Wizard of Oz that it, it's not the all powerful Oz; it's it's a guy behind a curtain, right? Right. Exactly. And, and, and I think the PGA Tour and the the uh, network carriers and whoever carries the golf tournaments has done an amazing job. Maybe it's a, a ancillary benefit that they didn't plan on, but they're showing obviously showing that the leaders or guys up on the leaderboard or the, or the girls up on their leaderboard every week, and it gives the illusion that right. that tour players never miss a fairway, they never miss a outs- right. anything outside of six feet. Um, yeah. But if you go to a tour event, if you're a, if you're an <laughs> average a lot of really golfer, right? Shots. And, and yeah. I, I've told people, I said, go to a tour event and and follow the guys. Or the girls who are, who are struggling to make the cut, I said you mm-hmm. want you want to see some crooked shots. Um, yeah. they're not perfect, not by any means. Now, when, as we alluded yeah. to earlier, we're talking about distances and yardages, and yes, you can hit it to a, a yard uh, on, mm-hmm. on 165 or 80 whatever uh, distance shot. But when you you do hit it crooked, nobody's perfect. I mean, we're all human, yeah. um, and yeah. most people, as they try to improve, they they have this I think uh, godlike vision of of what a tour professional is yep absolutely I, I i used to always tell guys in my club i was like listen i could grab a rank and file pga tour player bring him out here you'd play with him three days and one of those days you're you'd be like i cannot believe this guy plays on the pga tour because mm-hmm. they're they're human i mean i can't tell you the amount of guys that i played with in college or many tour golf or on the web.com tour where I, you know, and, and you catch everybody on a bad day. You don't really have a, a giant scope of what their game is and you watch them shoot a million and you know, whatever. And then, you know, a couple of years later, they're winning a PGA tour event. You're like, how is that even possible? <laughs> well, yeah. And I think it's, it's the guys who, all right, I'll give you an example. I, I just finished reading this book called, and evidently it's a, one of the best sellers on Amazon and it's going a little crazy, but it's called peak. P E A K and it, uh, uh, what the hell was in it? Uh, Secrets of the new science of expertise. So mm-hmm. it, it was always assumed that uh, that there were uh, uh, what do they call them uh, when they're great from a young age? Um, not not protege. Uh, I, I'm like you with the the name of the uh, tool. I'll um, think of it in a minute. Yeah. Um, phenoms yeah, like phenoms. That. So, yeah. and, and they, I mean, they open up the book with, with Mozart because they said at six years old, right. he had perfect pitch and they're like, that's unheard of. But what they found out later was Mozart's dad was a, a music teacher and he was teaching Mozart's older sister who was about, I think they said four years older. 
So from mm-hmm. the time that he was an infant in a crib or you know, wherever he was and, and listening to this thing the entire time, he was developing over that whole time. Right. And that by the time he's six, of course, if that's all he's done his whole life, he's going to be phenomenal at it. But the, the, as, as the book goes on, the, the point of it is it, if someone has ex, uh, phenomenal talent at, at one age, but you, you take that, that talent versus somebody who maybe learns how to just plot along – and they both do it the same amount of time, but the plotter continues to get input from coaches or teachers or, or mentors or somebody that helps them along. They're, they're going to pass that talented person who's just maybe become accustomed to relying on their talent. No doubt. Right. And I, I, I saw that a lot out playing. I'm sure you did too, where you got these guys that can do things with the golf ball that just, you like, how is this person not in the top five in the world? And they're struggling right. to make cuts on mini tours. Yep. Uh, and, and by the time you get to that level, it, it, it's very difficult to, to learn uh, a fundamental um, because their default is to go back to using their talent, you know, press right. the accelerator. Right. Yeah. I've seen some of the most talented guys uh, hit a golf ball and play golf that you've never heard their names. Mm-hmm. So the, the whole gist of the book was like, OK, I think they called it methodical learning. But, mm-hmm. you know, find somebody who, who can show you how to get to do what you want to do and then do that just each and every day. Just just get right. better uh, slowly and surely. And as long as you stick to it and, and follow that principle, you, right. you'll get to where you want to be. You're going to make mistakes. I mean, I think everybody goes through that. I, I know I did big time where it, oh, it, yeah. it helped me in my golf, but mine came from watching a biography channel where like, Sam Walton went bankrupt five times and right. Steve Jobs, well, Steve Jobs is a rare exception. You know, he goes from nothing to worth 10 million in a year and a hundred million the next year. <laughs> so maybe right. that's not the best example, but um, you know, all these people who just had failure, 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 but were learned along the entire process. And all next thing you know, like you said, they're winning a golf tournament. They're making the next greatest widget company, yep. anything um, that you never hear of them until they bust through. Right. No, it's a uh, golf is full of those guys that just gut it out and keep getting better. And you never heard of them. And all of a sudden, you know, they're making, making zillions of dollars out there. It's, it's awesome. What, when, when you got in that open, the 2010 open, what, what was kind of the, the most eye opening thing for you? Um, well, I would say on one side of the coin, me trying to hit, figure out how to hit it out of the rough Mm -hmm. and then Phil Mickelson coming out there with a bunch of balls and, and cutting through it like butter and them all floating up there and stopping to a foot. (laughs) We all, I just stopped and I was like, this is the most incredible thing that I've ever seen. Um, and you know, I see why he is what he is because I can't, I can barely even get it out of this stuff. Um, and then yeah, on the flip side, I remember I played a practice round. I randomly got hooked up with some guys from Sea Island and and I played with Brant Snedeker and um, he was, he had his swing coach out there. The guy did not have one solid shot in 18 holes. And I was like, this is unbelievable. This guy is, is in a dark, dark place right now. And he finished 10th (laughs) that week. And I just remember thinking like, I mean, there's no way that guy hit that many solid shots that week. He just gets it around. He puts it great. Um, you know, it, it's like these guys are not machines. And, mm-hmm. and so, you know, I took away a handful of guys. I, I, I hit balls next to Lee Westwood one day, and the sound that his golf ball made was something that I had never heard before. I, I was like, that that's the heaviest thud I've ever heard. So, you know, it was cool to see not only – kind of want to be inside the ropes and next to these guys that you grew up watching and to see what their ball flights look like and hear the sound that it makes and see all the good stuff. And then on the flip side, see, okay, they're also very, very human. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I was able to kind of, kind of learn from both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. That had to be pretty, uh, um, uh, like, like an, almost like an epiphany, right. And that, yeah. As we talked about earlier, where a where a, a, a professional golfer can go from just being on complete autopilot and playing at the highest level, and then just slowly drift downwards until they don't know 
which direction the ball is going to go. And then, yep. then you have an example of what you just did where, where you can see something. And it, instead of standing over a, a six footer um, or, or thinking that you have to hit your iron shots inside a 10 feet or you're never going to make a birdie, that puts pressure on your iron game. And then it puts pressure on your driver game. Next thing you know, your game's in the tank. But you seem to have taken that the other spectrum and that you went and said something clicked that said, well, okay, I don't have to press so hard. Right. I don't have to be perfect. Yeah, I um, I got a I got a putting tip that next year from from my coach. Um, just trying to get a feel for something kind of wacky. He kind of had me setting up like Jack Nicholas, where kind of crouched down, right elbow inside, and for whatever reason, I could feel the putter had released better than than anything that I had ever ever felt before. And I made everything for a year straight on the mini tours. It, it was incredible, and I just remember playing in the tour championship on that tour playing for a first place check that I'd never played before. And I, I, I was tied with this guy going into the last hole. I probably hit it about 15 feet on one side of the hole. He hit it about 12 feet on the other side of the hole. I just remember getting over this putt thinking I don't even have to read it. I don't have to aim. There's no way that it won't go in. I, it, I could, I could shoot it like a pool cue. And it went right in the heart. He missed. I won the tournament. And that is just, it's the biggest freaking conundrum of golf is how you can go from that one week to the next week, the whole looking like a thimble. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And nobody can put their finger on it. No, but it was, it was just like, it was the most surreal feeling. Uh, for me at that stage in my career, having that kind of pressure and just having zero doubt that there was any possible way that the putt could miss. And then, you know, thinking back, obviously, golf is a sport where you're going to fail tremendously more than you're going to succeed. All the other times where you're over a three footer, like, God, I, I mean, it doesn't even look like holes big enough to fit this golf ball. In. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so that, so you, you won your two, Two of your next three events after the open with, with that kind yeah. of understanding that you don't have to be perfect anymore and, and you hear a lot of people say that uh yeah. at, at that level and but then in 2011 i think you won some crazy amount of tournaments yeah. that year yeah kind of yeah. walk us through that year yeah um I, I was lucky at the beginning of that year I, i'd kind of gotten some confidence and um, my college coach called me and he was like, Hey, we're having Bob Rotella come back, um, and talk to the team. If you, if you're up around, you know, if you're not doing anything, you're, you're more than welcome to come sit in. Um, and there was just, there was a couple of things that he had said that to me just resonated. And one of the biggest things he, he, he said that I took away from it, I will never forget it. He said, somebody was talking about, how not to get frustrated and first tee jitters and all this kind of stuff. And he said, if I told you that you had won the tournament before you even teed off, would you let anything bother you? And of course the answer is, well, no, if I already won the tournament, if I got a bad break or hit in the water or whatever, who cares? Mm -hmm. It was like, that is the attitude that you have to have. Tee it up on the first tee as if you have already won the tournament. Because nothing at that point logically should ever bother you. And that whole year, I was just in this zone of, I, you know, what it doesn't matter. Whatever I do, I've already won the tournament. And it just, it gave me this level of freedom to go play and not let anything bother me. Um, and, and it was, it was awesome. And, and it, it's, Again, it's one of those crazy things where, you know, how do you go from feeling like that? And then, you know, of course, then you go, okay, now I'm on a different tour. I've got web.com tour status. And now there's more pressure and I've got to keep my card. I've got to make cuts and so on and so forth. Um, you know, and, and a lot of that stuff, you know, starts kind of falling behind the wayside. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you start kind of collecting demons as golf <laughs> kind of forces you to do and you know you you forget some of that just very basic stuff that 
is kind of what got you there. Um, but yeah, it was, it was crazy. Uh, uh, the combination of kind of understanding that everything didn't have to be perfect and getting some confidence in my putter and then just a handful of those things that, you know, ironically, one of his most famous books is not golf is not a game of perfect. Um, but just that, just dumbing everything down to just say, you know, don't, you know, stuff's going to happen. You can't let it bother you. And, you know, I, I think it, um, part of it is being comfortable in, in, in the environment that you're in. And yep. if, if you, your first year was, what you say, 2009 or 10? Yeah, I pretty much right. started playing full time in 10. So, so now you're, you've got a, a full year behind you. Um, you're in the 2000, you played in the U S open. You, now you're in the 2011. So you're, you're not as, um, uh, or you're more at ease with, with, with the different variables that come at you. You know what to focus on, you know what to let it roll off your back. And, and that seems to help. You know, I remember the first year I played was Oh one and Oh two and boo weekly was on the mini tours and, and he won something like nine times in six months or something stupid. Uh, I think he shot 41 under for two three round tournaments back to back. Jeez. Um and he was just on fire and then he he got his tour card that year at Q school and then I think he made only a handful of cuts. I mean he was so out of his element and he had, I think he admitted it. And then he went to then nationwide and and he plays a couple years and then obviously after I think 3 years he he gets uh his tour card again and then you know the rest is history cuz he had become comfortable in that environment. He knew what to expect. He knew not to to change who he was. Um, but, and, and I, the, to me, it sounds like that's kind of what you're describing a, a little bit in, in that yeah. you, you were able to, to calm yourself down because you had, you had the experience of doing it for a year behind you already. Yeah. And, and I mean, I can tell you that exact same thing happened to me. I got, uh, in 13, I got conditional status on the, on the web.com tour. And, and, um, and I just remember for some reason thinking I had to do something different. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, well, this is a bigger tournament. I got to you know, do more stuff and do this and do that. And, you know, all of a sudden there's equipment trucks and, you know, you get tee up money and all this kind of. I remember I was playing some stupid hybrid to make an extra like 200 bucks a week that I hated. And, <laughs> you know, you just you, you 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 get pulled into all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember I missed all these cuts and, you know, I got shuffled out and. I got in one more tournament late in the year. And by that point I was back playing mini tour golf and, you know, kind of back in my element playing well. And, you know, I just, I got in last minute, showed up and was like, yeah, screw it. And I finished like 25th or something. And I was like, why didn't I just do this earlier in the year? Um, you know, and luckily, you know, I, I was able to kind of get some status back out there the next few years, but yeah, I just, I, I missed like my first six cuts and, and it was just, I just, I was uncomfortable and I thought I had to do more and do this and do that because I was on this tour and, you know, it's, it, there's just, there's a lot of, a lot of factors. That's why I always, you know, it, it's so easy to look at scores and, and say, well, how does that person shoot that? And, and there's just, there's so much more to golf than just hitting a golf ball. Mm-hmm. You know, watching the PGA uh, a couple of weeks ago, Mickelson seems so relaxed or or yeah. calm in the situation he was in. Mm-hmm. Um, it was not, I mean, obviously he he made history, but for for the history he was going uh, to and what he was trying to do, I mean, no one had ever done it in history. And for him to be have at least on the outside look that calm, but I mean, he had like an a, a inner peace to him. Uh, no for, doubt for most of that final round, at least what I saw, uh, yeah. which was pretty cool to see. Yeah, I mean, you watch him, you watch when Tiger wins, they walk slower than everybody else, they chew gum, you know, it's like, you see that they're they're in their element, mm-hmm. you know, they don't always get to that point, but when they are to that point, they're comfortable there. I think when golfers or anybody, whatever profession, or when they think that they have to do extra, right. um, it is when they, they get in that, they blow an engine, they get in, into the red. You know, they're, yep. they're throttling it down so hard. Right. And it, it, well, it, you know, I guess maybe it takes failure. I mean, how, how do you get in, instincts? You know, you got to fail. And how do you fail? Well, you got to go through it. Right. You know, no, nobody's born 
nobody comes out of the womb with genius, as, as we alluded to with Mozart and all that stuff earlier. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I talked to um, Tim O'Neill about, we talked a little about sponsorships, and, and he got into what some of the the bigger ones like corn when you're on corn ferry and, and how much you get from, let's say a club company or a manufacturer and then how it goes up when you go to the tour. But, uh, mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you about, um, like when you're playing mini tours and, and you get some money from either a group or whoever it is, can, are you able to, to speak about how maybe you had your plan structured, for example, what might have been the distribution of any money that you won or earned? Uh, yeah. you know, when, when, when is that, obligation met when you know when you release and, and, and all those different things that some people might not know about well so i, I and, and i'm very different than most so when i was kind of struggling my first half of the year uh in 2010 i was just playing with kind of what i had my savings you know living trying to live for free mm-hmm. um you know any any money i had i was putting back into it and then luckily for me i didn't even have a place to play um you know, the Savannah Golf Club at the time wasn't doing super great. And, you know, they were like, hey, you know, you, you should probably join. And I was like, well, I, you know, I don't I don't really have the money to join. So I was kind of hopping around. And then luckily for me, I qualified for that U.S. Open. And when I got home, there was a bunch of bunch of bunch of members there that were like, hey, we need to we need to kind of rally around him. He's, he's one of our own. And, um, they, they they gave me a playing membership and then. The club organized basically uh they put out food and said hey you know if you want to come donate 100 bucks 200 bucks 300 bucks 400 bucks to to mark um and they basically did a fundraiser and i raised probably about seventeen thousand bucks wow everybody a bunch of people just pitching in a couple of hundred bucks a person and luckily no strings attached they were just like, hey, you know, go give it a shot. Um, and fortunately enough for me, um, that was right after the U.S. Open. I, I went out one, two or three mini tour events uh, that that year. So I didn't have to really dip into that. Um, the next year turned around and, you know, in 2011 and won 15 times or something like that. So for me, um, I was fortunate enough to be young and uh, had a free plate, didn't have any bills and everything that I made, I was able to put away outside of just my expenses. Um, and, and I never had to kind of go back to the well. Nice. Um, it's so, a, it's amazing. so I mean, yeah. that, 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 that's a perfect illustration of the Savannah golf club and the people of Savannah, at least to me, they're the best, right? The it's best. amazing play. I, I love going over there. I love just hanging out. And even if I'm just a f- guest fl- slash fly in the wall, um, I, I, that's one of my favorite places to, to play golf and just mm-hmm. relax and, and enjoy the time spent. I, I love that place. It really is. It's, it's an incredible club. But let me, so let we're moving on really almost year to year through your career. And, and one thing I want to ask you about is, uh, in being on the big break. Um, yep. so, <laughs> and huh. Tommy chef was on there too, after you, what, what is it with guys, Savannah guys and going on that show? Yeah, I mean, Justin Martinson, who was living in Savannah at the time, was on Tommy's show as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, for me, it was just, it was cool. Um, The guy who, so he ended up being my agent, but he was just, he was a guy that I met in Columbia, um, started kind of a small golf division of of what's what's called Empire Sports, which is now, he's kind of grown. Um, Just basically was like, hey, you're a Gamecock, I'm a Gamecock you know, you don't need an agent, but I'm happy to help you out any way I can. And, and we got to be close. And when I was after I had some success in the mini tours and played in the U S open was playing on the Hooters tour and, you know, doing, doing my thing. He called me and was like, Hey, do you, do you have any interest in being on the big break? I, you know, I kind of know some of the producers. I introduced them to Tommy Ganey. Um, you know, when Tommy ended up two gloves, ended up being mm-hmm. a big star of that show. And, um, you know, I'm going to put your name in there. And I was like, man, I don't, that's eh, kind of hokey. I don't <laughs> really want to do it. And I went and interviewed and didn't get a call back. Um, and the next year he called me again and he was like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to mention it to him. You should, you should go do a tryout. And they actually had 
they were at a Hooters tour event in Ocala, Florida. And I was like, ah, screw it. I'll, I'll do it one more time. And I went in there and did the whole deal and told him my spiel and got a call back a few weeks ago that said I was like a, some kind of semifinalist and I was out there playing really well. And, um, you know, was going through a bunch of stuff kind of personally. My, my dad was real sick and trying to play and, uh, you know, the, they, they got, got a call and said, Hey, we're, you're on the show. And, um, it was, it was crazy cause they don't tell you anything. They'll tell you who else is on the show. They don't even tell you where you're going. They just say, where do you want to fly out of? <laughs> and you get an airplane ticket that shows up that told me I was going to Roanoke, Virginia. And I'm like, what the hell's in Roanoke, Virginia? <laughs> you arrive in there and, you know, they put you on a bus and you roll up to the Greenbrier and there you go. It was a, it was a pretty crazy experience, but it was another one of those things where, um, I was just, I I was in this weird zone where nothing, I mean, I was so nervous. uh, But once I kind of got in, nothing was bothering me. And I just, I never thought for one second I wasn't going to win that show. You know, the the public only sees the edited show clips, but um, what what was it like, not behind the scenes, but just doing the show itself? Was there any kind of, funny crazy moments that that happened that... it it is all crazy i mean you are up at five uh you got to get mic'd up you know you got to get staged uh you know for the breakfast shoot um you know and then they give you a little bit of a warm-up and then before every event you have to sign a waiver uh with an attorney saying that you understand the rules um you know and then they shuttle you out then they got to set up the cameras they don't tell you what you got to do um what kind of rules are i mean what they mean you got to follow of course so you know if it's like a game of points or you know you're hitting it inside of you know a circle or it's a team thing and you got to sign a waiver to do that that you understand what the challenge is because they don't want to be in a situation where you hit a shot on you know and, and it's filmed once and you go back and say, Oh, that's not what, you know, that's not what Uh, they told me this game was. So every challenge you have to say, I understand Mm. and I can't go back and argue it. Um, so yeah, I mean, half the time, by the time you, you know, you go up and hit one shot over a flop wall or, you know, you hit one shot from here, you you hadn't hit a golf ball in an hour and a half. You've been sitting there. You're going in cold, going in cold. Um, So there's every shot that you hit on that show feels like the first shot of, of the, the most pressure packed golf tournament you've ever played. And you get no, you know, every, (laughs) no one with no warm up. you, you know, cause you know, every shot that you hit is going to be watched by hundreds of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, truthfully, the, the, the least nerves I had on the entire show were probably the last episode because you actually kind of got to play real golf. Mm. Yeah, I remember uh, when that show took off, uh, Kip Henley, uh, when he, yep. he and Don Donatello, and I had known oh, Kip, yeah. Kip's brother worked down here at Harbortown, Brent, and Brent's yeah. been on the show, and if Kip hears it, you know, I'm, I'm pestering the shit out of him to come on. Um, right. He said, shoot, I, I can't talk for more than, because your show's too long, I can't talk for more than 15 minutes before people want to, shut me off that's hysterical <laughs> but that that uh that, that was kind of the first one i saw and i, I think that's when it kind of blew up but that, that's pretty cool that you were on there what yeah what what did you take away from it that either you didn't have prior or you were unaware of before and how it might have helped your game yeah i mean it was just it was another kind of layer in that confidence um where i think i won on the hooters tour shortly after that if mm-hmm. i remember correctly um yeah, I mean, it was just, it was one of those things where, okay, this is another thing that I've kind of proved that I can do. If I can, if I can do that, uh, you know, in front of TV cameras, I can, I can go win out here on the Hooters tour. Um, I think I finished third on the money list that year. Um, it's different so, playing in front of cameras, isn't it? Ooh, yeah. But truthfully, you kind of like the crowds and the cameras and stuff, man, you, you kind of, you kind of, I, I always embrace that. Like I thought that was so cool that I get 
this audience that wants to watch me and now I get to show off. Mm -hmm. And the good thing for me is nobody knew if I had a crappy shot, nobody knew who I was. They were going to forget it in five seconds. So, you know, it was, it was always kind of a cool opportunity to, to get to show off. Like, um, I mean, making a putt or doing something in front of a crowd. Not that I, I really played in front of a whole lot of big crowds other than those couple of U S opens. Um, but man, doing something and hearing people go nuts because of something you did is just is the coolest feeling in the world. I remember the, the first time I had cameras following me, and, it, and this was many years ago. Uh, mm-hmm. It was it was the Florida Open, and way back when th- that was a pretty big tournament. Mm-hmm. Uh, and th- this was like Gary Nicholas was still playing mini stuff. Tim Petrovic, uh, right. there's probably a whole bunch of guys who I didn't even know. Uh, I was just a young kid, and. Um, I, I think I it was South Florida, and I think the first day I, I shot 69, so I was like second or third because it was so windy. It was 30, 40, 30 miles an hour all day. Uh, right. And the next day at the, I made the turn at about four under, and all of a sudden there's a dozen or more cameras following me. And I'm like, oh, I must be at or near the lead, and I think I went double, double bogey. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm, now I'm worried I'm going to make the cut or not. Um, so that was, for me, that was an eye-opening thing. It's like, hey. Yeah dickhead pay attention to what you're doing and not what's going on around you <laughs> yep easy to get sucked in mm-hmm. and, and when you know that's your first event that, that's of any size compared to playing at home um it's a little overwhelming right you know one thing i want to ask you about that a lot of people uh don't know about but they i mean they've heard of it but they don't know quite how intense it is and that's q school Ugh. <laughs> right, exactly well and the the amazing thing about that is all the stories and everything tim's stories they all come from q school finals mm-hmm. but there is nothing on planet earth worse than the back nine at second stage right if because if you don't get through you don't get status you don't get right? status anywhere now now granted i only played q school finals once where you could get a pga tour card so my frame of reference is not as good as somebody's like tim's where you could go straight i played one year where where i could go straight to the tour i was kind of you know i was just trying to get corn fair or web.com tour status at the time but um especially after they made the changes to where you could only get to the web.com tour um at least getting some status gives you a lot of perks. You know, you still get a web.com to a card. You can use PGA tour travel. You can, you know, all your Mondays are lower. You have, you have, you know, you're getting whatever clubs you want. Um, you're actually you know, you getting paid oper- to play it. Yeah. You know, and, and you get, you know, you, you, you're one Monday and, and one check away from shuffling in and, and having a cool job for the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. You miss a Q, that second stage of Q school by one. You've got nothing back at Not step a, one, step zilch. zero, step zero. So that to me, and I was, I, I kind of flew too close to the sun. I got through second stage of Q school, uh, my first handful of times. Um, and, and finally, went to the well too many times, I guess in 2016 or something, I was in good shape and kind of crapped the bed. And I was like, wow, I haven't experienced this before. Uh, this sucks. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, those last few holes at second stage, if you're somewhere near and it's like, you know, at least if I get it, get to Q school finals and play like crap, I got something to look forward to next year. If I don't get through second stage, I have absolutely nothing. Um, and, and then obviously you get to Q school finals and then, you know, it's a whole different kind of stress of, of, you know, trying to get, trying to get your status where you want it and all that kind of stuff. But man, that, that last day at second stage is, is that, that one takes, takes years off your life. Didn't you make something crazy like 10 birdies in a row one year? So, yeah. So at Q school finals one year, uh, I, like the fourth day I shot 62, um, the fourth day to go from way out of it to back in it and got full status. And then, um, the next year I had to go back to Q school finals and 
I was in like 130th or something going into the final round and the wind was blowing like 40 at PGA national. Um, and I shot 66 and ended up, I, uh, excuse me. I think I went from like 105th to 35th or something like that mm-hmm. the last day to secure my full status and, you know, get a nice paycheck there at Q school. So I, I definitely had some, some, very uncommon success where uh where i was getting through second stages when i needed to and then shooting some ridiculous scores at at q school finals when i needed to and um unfortunately uh i had to go back to second stage the next year i I, I missed out uh, on top 100 that year um by like 600 bucks or something like that Mm. i finished 102 on the money list which um and and kind of crap the bed at 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 second stage which were you know a couple of things that i had been doing really well in my professional career you know all things considered um and man you just like holy crap i just you know after a while you kind of assume that it's all going to work out and then all of a sudden it doesn't and you're like oh my god what do i do now now what right now what remember that was uh that was a long drive home from, from Tampa. What, what do you think it was? Because you, you obviously played exceptionally well. I mean, you won 15 times in one year. I mean, that's like, uh, beats Byron Nelson's record. And I don't care (laughs) what tour you're playing on, but that's a lot of wins. Um, and then to, to go from that level to, to struggling to stay in the top 100 Mm -hmm. on the nationwide slash corn ferry. What was it? It look, look, now that you've had enough time to, to digest mm-hmm. it and run it through your head and, and look back, do you think it was just, as we discussed earlier, that it, something that maybe you're uh, looking at it and your perspective was wrong? You just didn't have that, that moment like you did at the U.S. Open where it's like, look, I, I don't have to be perfect and you just couldn't maintain that maybe? Or it, well, was it something else that maybe yeah, that wasn't quite I mean- there? Well, you start to, you know, my entire life, and I think it was such a benefit that I was never one of those phenoms. Mm -hmm. I was somebody that just kind of kept getting better and kept getting better and kept getting better. And obviously, the better you get, the harder it is to get to that next stage. You know, eventually you start to plateau a little bit, which is what I was doing. You know, I I still had some success. I, you know, I did, I never won or, you know, I, I, contended on Sunday really at a web.com tour. Then I won on the Canadian tour, which was, which was a really cool deal. Um, but you know, then, then, you know, you start getting older and you're like, okay, a lot of these guys that I played many tour golf or played on the web.com. Now they're playing on the PGA tour and I'm still here. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it, that kind of thing. Okay. Now I'm a little bit older. I'm 30. Like, now it starts to kind of get in your head like okay at what point do you have to say like i should probably be playing on the pga tour or not having to go back to q school um you start unfortunately human nature you start thinking about those kind of things what you know then the what ifs well shoot what if i you know lose my web.com tour card then what am i going to do and and you all those thoughts that when you're 25 and you're living for free and you you know you're freewheeling it you, none of those thoughts are ever in your head but you know you start to get a little older and the okay you know I'm starting to become a real person now um, I have a house um, I've got responsibilities uh, you know I've got friends of mine that I was beating and 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 feel like I'm better than or as good at as that are now playing on the PGA tour, you, you know, you kind of start to put all this pressure on yourself. And before you know it, you know, you, you can't free up the way you used to. Um, and as we said that, 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 at that level, the, the margin for error is exceptionally it's so small. small. It's so small. And ev- for every one of us, you know, then, then you turn around, you look at, and there's a 23 year old guy out of college that's freewheeling it. Mm-hmm. hidden driver everywhere and no demons and like holy crap that used to be me <laughs> how can i go back and how can i go back and do that um you know and it's 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 kind of the evolution of things and and for me i you know i i stuck it out i went down and played in latin america and you know and played okay and 
and was still kind of, kind of, you know, I still had my head in it, but you know, then you get out there and all of a sudden you're like, Oh my God. Okay. Now I've got the chipping gifts. Where did that come from? Um, you know, things pop up and, and for everything that pops up, it just, you start having those thoughts of, well, shoot, you know, what, if, if this doesn't work out, then what am I going to do? And, um, you know, it, it's a snowball. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I always, I, I always kind of pride myself. I stayed positive. I, I, I stayed realistic and, you know, it eventually gets to the point where, you know, you gotta, gotta figure out what to do. You you played how many PJ tour events did you play in? Greenbrier uh, was one. Yeah, US I played Open. The, yeah, I actually had a pretty good record. I, I Monday in the Sea Island a couple of times, twice, and Jackson, Mississippi, and the Greenbrier, and a couple of U.S. Opens. And gosh, I feel like I played played somewhere else too. Um, you made the lost. cut at the second Open you got in, didn't you? I did. Yeah, out in Chambers Bay. Um. But but yeah, lost in lost in a few playoffs as well. Uh, I've, I've probably played about eight, I would guess. It, to to take everybody through what what a week at at the biggest stage in golf is like that 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 might not uh, that might always wondered uh, mm-hmm. at, at wonder what an in, inside perspective is. It's uh it's a lot. Um, it it, it really a lot is. going on in there. It, there's a lot going on, especially, you know, if you kind of have a frame of reference, you know, I just remember playing mini tour events. And when I Monday qualified for my first web.com tour, event, I was like, holy crap, this is cool. There's like free stuff. And, you know, there's, <laughs> <laughs> the bags are on the range. Just yeah, take what you yeah, want. Uh, yeah. I mean, everybody's got staff bags and there's, you know, an equipment trailer. and Oh my God, there's putters laying out around the greens and, you know, and, and it's like, it's like that times a billion. Um, you know, there's, they, you show up and, you know, you, I just remember at the airport and they're like, here's your Lexus courtesy car, <laughs> um, you know, and here's your bottles of wine and, you know, what do you need? What, what can we get you? And, uh, here's this call this number if you need anything. And, you know, you go and, and, you know, there's, you, you kind of, for the fans that you saw it when you're registering, you put your name down you know, in slots to play practice rounds. And, you know, you look and there's Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods. <laughs> of course, every person's thought is, should I just put my name with him and see what happens? Um, but it's just a, you know, the infrastructure that they build. You know, you go out on a Tuesday and you hit a shot in a practice round and there's, you know, there's 200 people in one of the grandstands and they're going nuts about, a, <laughs> you know, just a goof off chip shot and, there's just people everywhere. It's just, it's so hard to describe. I I mean, I was so the first one, I just, I never left. Like I I just, I I was so enamored with the whole experience. I never left the golf course. I was there like 24 (laughs) seven every day leading up to it. Cause I was like, ah, oh, maybe I should go play a little bit. Oh, I'll go hit a few. Well, it's like you're, you're oh, living I'll your dream, out. right? I mean, yeah, so- yeah I'm going to go see if I, you know, maybe this three would, you know, and it was just, it was awesome. And I shot a million and you know, yeah, I left there thinking, man, you know, if I, if I did got to do that again, I, I would do a lot of stuff differently. And that, and that's what I did the second time. I, you know, I had my whole family out there, a bunch of friends flew out there and, and, and it was an incredible experience. And, and the second time I was playing, playing on the corn fair web.com tour and, and, and played well in a sectional and had to go straight from, from sectional to go play the next web.com tour event. And it was out in the middle of nowhere out in the Pacific Northwest. And all my family's like, what are we going to, and I was like, no, I don't want anybody to come. I love y'all. <laughs> I don't want anybody to come. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to try my best to treat it like any other golf tournament. I don't want to have to worry about anything. I just want to be able to go do my thing. And, and that's it. I had a couple of buddies that were like, I don't care. You don't have to, you don't even have to talk to us, but we're coming. I'm like, that's <laughs> fine. Y'all can come, but I'm not, I'm not doing any of this. Yeah. And, I'm not, I'm uh, not having no, responsibility I'm, of your no, being I'm your not. entertainer. No, no. And, um, and it was, and it was awesome. And it would have been really hard. It was going to be super expensive to get out there. And, and, and I told all my family, I was like, I love y'all. I'm going to call in every day. I'll talk to you, but I, I just, I, I'm just going to go out there and, and, you know, we, we all got to do it. 
um, and experience it out at Pebble. And this time I'm just, I'm just going to go out there and, and, and just do it. And, um, and it was great. I, you know, I didn't, not, didn't exactly contend, but got to play on Sunday and got to play with Ernie Els on Sunday, which was really cool. And, you know, and, and played fairly solid. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it was, it was just, it, it's, it's just there's so many people and the and the vibe around the place is just it's it's so electric and and i just remember on the first tee of both u.s opens i i was i was not even scared to hit a bad tee shot i was scared to make a golf swing and look down and the ball still be on the tee (laughs) like i've been nervous there's nervous and then there is i might whiff this ball nervous i used to have that nightmare all the time yep and no matter how many times i swung i'd whiff Yep. Yep. Or there was going to be like a giant divot and mm-hmm. the ball still on the tee. Yep. So what was it? Uh, how was the big easy to play with? He was awesome. And he was very much over that place. Cause I don't know if you remember that. That was a very interesting golf course, mm-hmm. with, uh, dirt greens. Yeah. And, they lost you know, the greens. And, and yeah. And we we're in like 45th or 40th going into the final round. I remember I had two, four putts on Saturday. I actually played really well. I had both par fives and two and made two sixes. Oof. Um, and so, so we're going out and, you know, he's like, get me the hell out of here, <laughs> get me on my jet, and go to whatever my next tournament is. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, last place here gets like 20 grand. Like, you know, <laughs> You're I'm, trying I'm to calculate. Like, I'm freaking out. And, you know, and so he wants to talk about anything but golf. And he's, you know, he's like, I'm just, I'm playing with some dude that that's, you know, that's just some random qualifier and, you know, teed off early on Sunday, just get me away from this place. And I'm like grinding my balls. Yeah. He's playing for airplane gas money. Yeah, exactly. And I just, I remember like I, I hit the par five number. I birdied 16 and I birdied, uh, I hit the green and two on 18, this par five. And I hit this putt up this hill and I had probably two and a half feet straight down the hill. And, my first thought was, okay, if I miss this putt, I may have a wedge shot coming back. <laughs> and my second, you know, and I'm like, holy crap, you know, even though I'm in 50th place, I mean, the difference between this spot and the next spot is probably a couple of thousand dollars, mm-hmm. you know, something that would never occur to Ern- Ernie Ells. I'm like, well, uh, still, still would be pretty cool to, you know, birdie two out of the last three holes and make an extra couple of thousand. And, you know, it's funny thinking back my experience versus his on that Sunday. And I'm <laughs> sitting here telling everybody, I, I got to play with Ernie Els and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he'd see me and be like, you know, who are you? Um, but it was, uh, it, it was cool and stuff like that. Just all the, all the stuff and all the stress and, you know, all that stuff and that comes along with professional golf. Those, those kind of memories were just awesome to, to have. For, for those that might've watched it and not understood, uh, stood the conditions of those greens, it, it, it's uh, what DJ did on that last hole where, where he three putted to, to lose it, getting into the playoff. It, mm-hmm. And, and you just alluded to it, that the greens were not very good. They lost them dirt. Yep. Um, could, could you, 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 I'm sure you more than anybody and being above the hole, you, you could see maybe how, oh. how he ended up doing that. No doubt. No doubt. Cause I, everybody was talking about it and we were sitting in a bar watching it. Um, and I was like, I, I mean, he's up on that top shelf. I was like, if this putt and he had like 12 feet or something, mm-hmm. I was like, if this putt doesn't hit the hole. It's he, he's going to have a four or five footer coming back. Ernie had hit one from below the slope up past the hole. Now this was on a different angle up past the hole. And it got like six feet past the hole and came back all the way back to below the hole. Did a wow. U-turn past the hole and came back and it, and I finished four or five hours before these guys got there. Those mm-hmm. greens were ba- even more baked out and crusty. Trampled and everything else. Got there. Yeah. And I had a two footer that from behind the hole thinking if this lips out or power lips or something, who knows what I'm going to have coming back. I may, I may be here all afternoon. <laughs> and so when he had that putt and he three putt and I was like, yeah, I mean, it's, he barely touched the first one and it went four feet by. And now you got a four footer on dirt to get into a playoff. It's, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to armchair quarterback and say, ah, you know, how you lead the, it lead a major three putt from 12 feet. But it was, uh, 
like I said, on, on Saturday, I had 30 feet for Eagle on number eight and made six. And I had about 60 feet on 18 for Eagle and made six. Mm. So, uh, and it, it's, it was a, it was an interesting place. It was, it was doable. Yeah. It, it's those small. And I remember, uh, what year was it? Oh, one that Goosen missed a short mm-hmm. one at yep. Southern Hills. Very, very similar. Yep. To, and to Stuart Sink missed one right in front of him mm-hmm. from like a foot and a half or something. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, when, when the greens are that bad and, and it's just, it just plays yeah. with your brain. And, and, and as you, yeah. you mentioned and have gone over multiple times tonight that you, you start creeping into a, a tour pro's head and, and it can, that pebble can turn into a giant avalanche pretty quickly. Yes, it can. Or, or, or detriment. I shouldn't say quickly. I said it can be detrimental. Correct. You know, just, and I, you know, I, the, the best example of that is this, the first cut at Augusta. And everyone says, well, the first cut for those guys, is, it's not that bad. And it's Augusta. How, how difficult can the first cut be? And I'm like, yeah, but you got to remember the greens are hitting too. And, mm-hmm. and they need to, they really need to hit the spots there. And all you have yeah. to do, the, the worst thing you can do to a touring pro is, is put one shred of doubt in their Correct. head right because and yep. and they're always talking about it they, oh i didn't commit to that shot on 15 or i didn't commit to that shot here you know and, and right that, that that's the example um yep for for that caliber of player you know l- looking back is there anything that you would have done differently um i mean i think maybe later in my career i probably could have put more effort into trying to maybe travel to, to play a little more around some tour guys. Um, you know, I loved Savannah. Um, and, um, there, there were a couple of things in my, you know, growing up early on, you don't really think about those kind of things. You don't have to think about those things, but definitely the more you get, I wouldn't say comfortable, but you kind of get in a pattern Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I had a good pattern as I was getting better and better and better. And I probably don't think I evolved later in life, um, to try to change that pattern up, um, as much as maybe I possibly could have. Um, but then again, I, I could not be happier with where I am right now. So whatever mistakes that I made in my professional golf career has gotten me to where I am right now. And I, 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 I in, in that regard, I wouldn't change a single thing, but, um, in golf, it, you know, everything works until it doesn't. Um, and, and I would say I was a little stubborn in the fact that I, I would kind of, I had my, routines and and how I worked on my game and what worked to make me get better for so long. And when it stopped working, I was probably a little stubborn that I was just going to, I was going to keep hammering that and not change it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, and and there were probably some things that I could have done to, to put myself in more uncomfortable positions or maybe expend a little more effort to, to get in some situations that maybe could have helped me adapt a little bit better. Um, but you know, it's kind of part of life. It's all hindsight is definitely 50, 50 at the time or, or 2020 at the time. I thought I was doing what I, what I needed to be doing. Yeah. And um, you, you alluded to that earlier that, that, um, at, at, at that level, it becomes very difficult to, to, to progress because you're, you're yes. getting up to the, the, the top of the mountain is there's not many up there and, and, and right. the journey, the higher you go becomes more limited and if, if you make the decision to do something that's uncomfortable and it's the wrong decision you can take a quick spiral yes right and very then, much so th- then it's a very difficult climb to get back to where you were so uh it's easier for armchair golf coaches so to speak meaning the general public golfer to sit there and say well mark if he would have done this i, I know he would have right. done yeah. something better well, but yeah every, but you're not got an opinion. right you're not in his shoes right you right. don't know the variables uh uh that 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 he had to deal with or how, what recipe would have gotten you there? If somebody had a magic right. wand to say, okay, Mark, all you gotta do is tweak these two things and you do, and then you're there, but nobody has that. Nobody knows. Right. That's exactly right. And, and the other thing is, you, you know, looking back, that's why I always end that question with looking back. And I ask most 
every guest that comes on that because as much as you wanted something, you with your with playing, myself with playing, and, and to play the PGA Tour, it, it's look when you look back, you can connect the dots much easier to where you are now, and and when you're looking forward, it's very very difficult because yes. you know you don't know what's in store for you, but it, right. it will play itself out. Exactly right. So what what's the next chapter in the book of Mark going to be about? What, what do you have going next? Oh man, well other than uh, you know semi pro pickleball. Um, <laughs> 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 no, I got, I got a cool job opportunity. I, I luckily for me, um, you know, and, and doing what we do, you, you meet a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, looking back in hindsight, I was glad that when I went to college, I, you know, I took my studies, uh, seriously. Um, you know, let the, it's always kind of the, the, the old person to the young person, hey, make sure you get your college degree and all that kind of crap. And, and, uh, you know, as it turns out, it's actually true. Um, so <laughs> I, um, <laughs> you know, I, and, and so, you know, I, I kind of always try to do things the right way and talk to people and, you know, when you meet people at pro-ams and, you know, you, you, you engage and, and, and I always kind of had that appreciation for, for events and pro-ams and things like that, that, Hey, you know, they, yeah, sometimes you're like, oh, I really don't want to have to do this, but you know, without without these kind of things, there there you know there are no golf tournaments. So after a while, you um, you know you develop some skills, and um, luckily for me, that there are some jobs that um, have that those skills apply for, and. Um, and um, so I got to meet some people that saw those skills as something valuable and decided to hire me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm working right now for uh, some guys that, that do some work in, in estate planning and investment banking and um, I'm really enjoying it. And I get to use kind of those skills that I developed um, throughout professional golf to apply to, to a new phase in life. It's awesome. It, it, it like I said, it, it, you can connect the dots back. You can see how your golfing ability and the way you, that you work with people, it, it, you know, it, it, as you said, they're doing the right thing it has led you to this. It's just, that's why it's a preface it with what's the next chapter. Um, right. It's a, it's a continual book until, uh, we no longer uh, walk the planet, walk the face of the earth. Here, one one question before we'll, we'll do some rapid fire here shortly and get you going. Sure. Um, I have to ask you about uh, the golf bag that you had get run over by at airport baggage car. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Mr. Clements for that. Uh, sending us that question to ask uh, Mark. <laughs> okay. So wasn't an airport baggage car it was a maintenance car in <laughs> in panama i was uh we had, had this terrible winter here and the first event of the of the web.com tour season was um was in panama so i flew down like sunday afternoon and i was like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna get a good practice session in on monday play my you know maybe go play nine holes and you know and and, and kind of ease into the week so we get out there on monday af monday afternoon and i'm like hey you know a couple of my buddies we're gonna go play so um we get to the fourth hole and after the fourth hole you gotta walk up this giant hill to get to number five tee box so my bag's laying on the ground my caddy's walking around um you know finding looking at hole placements and stuff like that so i finished i went to go put my putter in my bag and i was going to start up the hill and I leaned over to put my putter in my bag and I hear somebody say, watch out. <laughs> and out of the corner of my eye, I see something and I jump back and a maintenance cart with a, towing a lawnmower is coming like a hundred miles an hour, barely misses me, <laughs> clobbers, drives over all three sets of tires over my golf bag cross the front of the green down another hill and crashes into this fence along the side of this canal that ran along the right side of the fairway. And I look up and there's this worker up there with his hands up in the air. And I was like, what just happened? 
And I pick up my golf bag, all of my head covers just collapse. <laughs> my drivers in three pieces, my three woods in two pieces. This is my first day down here, first tournament of the year. And my bag's all wonky. And all the guys in my group were like, oh my God, are you okay? I was like, if I'd have been six inches closer to my golf bag, I'd be decapitated right now. Mm. And so picked up everything, walked straight to the driving range. Uh, there, obviously there are no equipment trailers down there. Uh, but my tailor made rep was down there and he had just a, a suitcase with some couple of heads and shafts. And he was like, Hey, what do you need? I was like all new woods. <laughs> so, um, that was, uh, that was interesting. I actually played okay that week, but yeah, I, uh, had to get a lot of stuff rebuilt once I did get back to the United States. Well, that's good. It was replaceable. Yes. Cool. my head is not <laughs> what 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 happened to the cart did the guy lose brakes or what was uh, yeah the deal? i guess he had parked it on the hill and had put the emergency uh, you know the parking brake on and i guess it popped off the emergency brake is all i could think about mm -hmm. i didn't speak english so he didn't say anything to us as he walked by <laughs> uh but yeah i guess it came off the brakes and he had hopped out of the cart and was waiting on us to finish putting and it just trucked on down this hill and Almost took me out. Mm, God. Couldn't even imagine. I mean, like I told Tim, it's hard enough playing professional golf in, in why well, I never went outside of the country. It's hard for me. It was hard enough playing, getting around, driving, looking at this was before map quest and iPhones or anything. Right. I, I, and you know, the, the big Atlas in the back seat that you pull out and okay, I'm on I 10, I 95, 75, all those, the, the highways. Uh, I couldn't imagine going to another country where you don't even speak the language. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it is interesting. Very, very interesting. You, those, those first couple of events every year in, in Panama and Bogota, and then had a couple of years where we played in Brazil or, you know, and, and Chile, there was always some, always something happened to somebody. Mm. All right. Let's, uh, want to wrap up some rapid fire. I got, Emergency nine, I call it. Okay. And then uh, get you going and enjoy your evening. So uh, if you were, let's say you went and Monday into something and you won and got on a hot mm -hmm. streak and you qualified for the Ryder Cup. Yep. Uh, what would be your walk-up song to the first tee? Uh, Sandstorm, which is what they play at uh, University of South Carolina football games to get mm -hmm. the fans fired up. There you go. Gamecock in your blood still. Yep. Uh Speaking of songs, what's the last song that was stuck in your head? The last song that was stuck in my head, uh, probably Hey Jude. <laughs> it will probably be stuck in there the rest of the night. You're going to yep. curse me up and down at four o'clock in the morning when you wake up. Yep. You enjoy that. <laughs> uh, you played a lot of golf courses. What's the best one you've ever played? <sighs> um, I mean, I, I'm a Georgia boy, Augusta National. You have played Augusta. Very cool. I have. Yep. Yeah, that'd be. Yep. That's a, uh, that's Mecca. Mm hmm. Uh, let's see. Dream foursome. Uh, and it cannot be porn stars. But anybody, uh, past or present golfers, um, anybody, anyone you want to play with, you know, now that I'm, now that I'm older and a little wiser and, uh, you know, to be sentimental, I would probably say my dad, Mm-hmm. Um, Steve Spurrier, um, Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, mm -hmm. uh, and when well, you, you'd be the fourth and, huh? And then you, oh, you're, yeah. you're the there fourth. You there you go. Yeah. I wouldn't even say any golfers. That That's a pretty cool one. Yeah. Uh, let's see a couple more, uh, tin cup or caddyshack. Caddyshack. I hate tin cup. <laughs> Uh, last book that you read. The last book that I read was actually, uh, believe it or not, a, uh, a business book called the game of numbers. Mm. Yep. Cool. Mm -hmm. Is it kind of like, uh, was it Billy bean, that sort of thing with the baseball? It, more or less. Yeah. A little, uh, not, not quite as quantitative, mm -hmm. but yeah. Uh, let's see if there was an emoji on your stamped on your clubs, what would it be? Oh, the emoji. Ugh. 
um, probably the uh, the flexing arm. I always give that to people when I hit a good shot, just to get <laughs> at them a little bit. Show them your guns. That's right. There we yeah, go. Or lack thereof. Uh, cats or dogs? Yes. Um, I actually have a cat. Uh, randomly uh, that that found his way into my house, but I shoot, I'd pet a squirrel if it let me pet it. <laughs> and I'm a big animal guy too. Yeah, yeah. And then the last one, uh, the goat, tiger or jack? Tiger. Jeez, that, uh, that, that was probably I the just, quickest one I've got. Yeah, I mean, I, I it, it just being in the tiger and see what seeing what he did, it's 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 pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's hard to argue. I mean, it, what he did was just mind-boggling. It, it really is now, especially that we're a little bit removed from it. Going back and looking at it, it, it is it is astounding. Mm-hmm. I agree. All right, um, it's been great. Uh, great to catch up. Um, next time I'm, I and we talked about this before. You know, I'll be hopefully playing over there soon. I'll, I'll give you a shout, and we can hang out, have lunch, have beers, play cut up some more and uh tell some more stories look forward to it awesome mark you have a great night i'm sure everyone's gonna love you this too. One. sounds good man thank you all right everybody thank you so much for listening to today's show if you enjoyed it you can find more information on today's episode and other topics at golf 360.blog there you'll find the show notes and links links related to this episode as well as any other episode that we've done so far to date If you're interested in improving your game and would like to learn more from yours truly by taking a private lesson, a half-day or multi-day school, club or putter fitting, you can reach me through the blog site or by email, pete at golf360.blog. So some of you may be asking, what is the golf paradigm? All you have to do is click on the homepage while on my blog site to discover how you can start playing better than you ever thought possible. Or you can simply sign up again on the blog page for my instructional videos where I give regular tips on all areas of the game to include the swing, club design and fitting, health, fitness and nutrition, the mental aspects, and equally as important, the integration of all those things together. I'm also on social media and you can find me at The Golf Paradigm, that's P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M, and I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, also under the same name, The Golf Paradigm. Facebook is usually the best way to reach me for questions and or comments, and I look forward to hearing what all of you have to say. This podcast is brought to you in part by Old South Golf Links. A short ride across a bridge from Hilton Head Island is one of the area's finest golf courses and a hidden treasure. Set up on towering pines and ancient oaks with sweeping march vistas, truly makes Old South Golf Links a -a one-of-a-kind golfing experience. The Clyde Johnson design was named one of the top 10 new public courses when it opened, and it also takes full advantage of the natural beauty of the low country. Old South is a fun and unique challenge for golfers of every skill level and a favorite of both locals and visitors. Whether it's your first time here or you're a regular, you'll be treated and feel like family. From the bag drop to check-in at the fully stocked pro shop with both men's and women's apparel, to breakfast or lunch before or after your round, the staff is always ready and willing to help. Experience for yourself why Old South is one of the premier golf courses in the Hilton Head area and why it will quickly become a favorite of yours too. Visit them in person or online at www.oldsouthgolf.com or to make it tea time, simply call the pro shop at 843-785-5353.